Well, good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, depending upon where you are in the world, and welcome to today's DevOps.com webinar. I'm Charlene O'Hanlon, moderator for today's event, and I welcome you. We have a great event on tap, as always, the Fotora folks always do a great job. But before we get started, we do have a few housekeeping items we need to go over. First of all, today's event is being recorded. So if you miss, miss any or all of the event, you will have the opportunity to access it later. Following today's webinar, we will be sending out an email that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. And we are taking questions from the audience. So if at any time during today's presentation, you have a question for any of our speakers, please don't wait, don't hesitate. Just use the question and answer tab there on your interface and submit your questions. And I'm sure we'll try to get to as many as we can near the end of today's webinar. We also have a copy of the slide deck uh, actually in the handout section for you. So uh, if you're looking for it, uh, just go over there. And we do have a, an ebook offering for you that is in the public chat. You can uh, download the ebook. Uh, the, the link is there so you can download it. And then they'll, uh, we'll also have a little bit more about that at the end of today's webinar. We also have two polling questions. We hope we can get everybody engaged in that. And as always, we have a very interactive chat. So we do encourage you to please chat us your questions, comments, suggestions, and I'm sure uh, whatever you chat in will probably get included in the conversation. And then finally, at the end of today's webinar, we are doing a drawing for four $25 Amazon gift cards. So please stick around. Hopefully you'll be one of our four lucky winners. All right, I think I went over everything that I'm supposed to go over. So without further ado, let's go ahead and kick off today's webinar, which is release management has progressed. Have you? Our speakers today are Helen Beal, who is the chief ambassador over at the DevOps Institute, and uh, Jeffrey Kais, who is the VP of product marketing strategy over at Platora. Jeff yep. and Helen, great to see you both. I know you guys have a special guest on this webinar. Our special guest for this one is Simone Jo Moore, who is with Humanizing IT. So all three of you, thank you so much for being here. Welcome to the webinar. I'm going to take myself off uh, camera, put myself on mute, let you guys dive right into today's presentation. Perfect. Thanks so much, Charlene, and hello, everybody. Um, we love having interactive conversations in our live webinars, so um, I have kicked off a little chat, a silly little chat about favourite fruit in the chat, but please do um, put any comments you have in there or any questions in Q&A. Um, Simone, are you there? Should we do a little intro if you are there? We're having a couple of audiovisual problems this morning, so I should just carry on for the moment. So today we're going to be talking about uh, release management and that it's progressed and asking if you have also progressed. So our talk map, we're going to start by talking about what happens when a bad process is automated. Then we'll look at what we actually do need to inspect when we're looking into a process and talk about how the release process can be improved and optimized. And then bring this all together and talk about how value stream management fuels process and innovation. So as I said, We'll be answering questions live, so add them to chat or questions and answer. We don't mind. Um, just keep the conversation coming. Perfect. Perfect. And Jeff's audio is working. His lights are working, and he's winning. <laughs> he's winning. The mangoes are winning. It's all good. And it looks Absolutely. Up. We've got Simone back, so we might actually have a full house of speakers for you. Any oh, second. good. You know, nothing like fun, fun problems when you're going out. Which brings us back to SPOFs. You know, things that make Spoffs. the process bad. <laughs> yeah. We might need to tell people what a spoff is. So it's a single point of failure. Simone, you're here. Tell us um, what could be a spoff. What sort of things are single points of failure? Me, perfect example because I'm my own person, my own consultant in my own space. And, you know, depending on the resources and capabilities I get from my support crew, it's quite possible that you have other individuals that also have a very specific role that there's no backup for or no other core capabilities for. And for it is a single point of failure and a risk. Absolutely. I think quite often we get this... Um, Alignment's probably the wrong word, but we conflate um, spoffs with heroes sometimes. I'm thinking of the Phoenix Project and Brent, the character yes. in particular, yeah, who we had to rely on so heavily. And I saw this 
Um, I saw this really early on in my journey into release management, but I suspect it still exists out there. And I think the way that release management seemed to evolve was that people had to do more and more things. So they uh, there would be normally one person that was doing it and they'd say, oh, God, I've had enough of doing this. So they'd automate a few things. They'd write a few scripts and then they'd write more and more scripts and they'd end up with what I used to refer to as a script monster. Um, and it was doing good work in that it was making things easier and quicker and reducing toil and all of the onerous manual work that we don't want to do. But on the other hand, it created a problem because only the person that had uh, written or even birthed the script monster was the person that understood it. And they were a classic single point failure in the release process. Jeff, have you seen that? I Yes, all the time. And, it, and it's sad. It, it, I think the challenge is that so many people look forward to automating the process they get so focused on what technology i'm going to use how i'm going to write this organize the code how i trigger it without really spending the time to rethink it to even um have a moment to say well maybe that's maybe that's not the right thing to be doing maybe there's a better way uh, maybe we don't have to do it in the in the same steps that it was done previously because uh it was set that way originally because it made more sense from a manual point of view um it, things that make a process bad certainly are are not planning on that resiliency, not planning on the uh, uh, ways that automation can really, really help where you don't need user input. Um, and and re-architecting and, and thinking about a process from a perspective of how a machine would do it versus how a human would do it, that's always going to be different, always. Absolutely. And I love um, the one of these other ones we've got, because I think it can both be a spoff and a non-value adding step. So just adding to our uh, acronyms in our industry. CABs, change advisory boards or change approval boards, depending on uh, how, um, how dictatorial your organization is, I guess. So why doesn't a cab add value? Now, Simone, some of you may be wondering where Simone has gone. Simone lives out in uh, France um, quite remotely, and she uh, is having some weather there right now. So she's experiencing <laughs> some um, some connection challenges. I believe we still have a bite audio, and if she's there. Yes. Like Can you still hear me? Yeah. Am I here? Excellent. I think I'll stay off audio just to keep the bandwidth capacity uh, as operational as possible. Perfect. So let's talk about cabs. Do cabs add value, Simone? I was going to say, you had to use that four-letter word, didn't you? Um, <laughs> yes, I do believe they do in certain aspects. Um, I think part of the aspect of cab is to not go off onto other tangents, as can often happen, and lead us down another path. Uh, especially, you know, if something is not intended, uh, then it's a design fault. And we're supposed to be picking up those sorts of things uh, when it comes to the cab. And what I mean by that is, oh, have we incorporated everyone? I think one of the biggest faults is making, you know, is not having the right people in the same room at the same time. Now, in my with my value stream mapping head on, when I talk about what a value adding step is, I would say a value adding step is something that creates value that the customer is going to use. So. In that definition, Jeff, would you say that a cab is a value adding step? Well, a cab is a checkpoint. And, um, and, and what makes a cab difficult is that it's a manual checkpoint and it's left up to whoever the people are happening to be in the room, which oftentimes aren't the people actually doing the actual work. So they're having the information gather to try to come up with did the right things happen. A cab is intended to verify that the right things happen. Why, from a, a, an automation and a, a automated process point of view, there's some big gaps in that, that the people that are in the room for the cab um, may not have the latest information. They may not have complete information. And it's a, that manual step that is going in um, oftentimes can, can be worse than not having it at all. Now, granted, I love the idea of having a point in time where all things must be done and make sure that every, you know, it, it's, a, it's a milestone point, right, to make sure that you can get things going forward. But from an automation point, if all your validation and verification is done before and all is part of an automated process, what's the point of having a cab anymore? I mean, I, I know from a, a perspective of, of DevOps, the, the goal would be to get rid of that completely. Wouldn't everybody be happy if we could? 
Um, but we'd have to do things to verify that we're doing a better job um, in a new process than a cab can do in an existing process. You know, lacking, if everything's just manual, then yeah, having a cab is great. But as soon as you start making some uh, process improvements, it becomes uh, a question. Absolutely. And I just posted um, a quote from our book that we are, have launched today. Cabs are not considered good practice in DevOps as research shows that they negatively correlate with the high performance because they slow cycle time. So we've got to be careful with our processes because they can be full of things that uh, maybe aren't great. So all of the toil, duplicating information, manufacturing reports, working around technical debt um, and these cabs. So let's try our first poll today. I'm going to go ahead and kick that off. The question we're asking is, would you kill your cab? And you have a number of answers. Uh, if I had the chance, without mercy, I have already buried it. The cab is dead. Long live the cab. No, <laughs> I love the cab. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, we're not best friends, but it does help. So which of those polls would you like to, or which answer on those polls would you like to do? I've actually done the second poll first because it popped I just up. want to know what Simone was oh. drinking when we were writing this. That was the... <laughs> <laughs> she was drinking wine. She's always drinking wine. It's the best poll we've ever done. Come on. <laughs> I, I think it is. It's actually one of the best questions ever. Uh, I think, uh, you know, we, we talked about, oh, who was it? Oh, it was quite some time ago. And uh, killing the cab has been a conversation that's been around for a while, I think. Um, I do like the one without mercy. Um, you know, but my other favorite is as long as we don't get caught. And do you know what? That reminds me of so much of the process crap, doesn't it? It's, it's like, oh, we'll do this. And we'll go outside process or we'll, you know, bend the rules while nobody's watching just as long as we don't get caught. Right. Well, and the cab has always been, I mean, that's sacrosanct. Oh, my gosh. We're going to kill War Room? No way. We can't kill that. that you know, <laughs> the whole world would stop moving at that point. Um, time to rethink it. I'm trying to find that IT skeptic uh, link to put in there in the chat. It was in the slides, but I've lost it. But we will find it again shortly. Shall we close the poll and see how we got on yeah. with that? Yes. So let's see what we got. We had the most popular answer was G. No, we're not best friends. <laughs> they 41% feel that their cab is still adding some value, even though it's a little bit painful. Uh, mm -hmm. Next, most popular answer, 24%. Um, I have already buried it. 18% said, yes, as long as I don't get caught. Your favourite answer, <laughs> yeah. And then 2% said, if I had the chance, and 1% uh, without mercy. So um, generally, I think the general consensus is we'd kind of like to get rid of the cap or certainly change it um, at least. I think it's giving it a new a new look and feel and wardrobe and making things fit the way we want them to fit now. I don't think it fits the current context of the way we work. Yes, indeed. So, um, because I ran the first poll, I'm wondering when to run, or I ran the second poll first, I'm wondering when to do the next one. But let's just talk about some other, let's go to the next slide first, and then we'll come back to that and talk about what happens when we automate a bad process and why we don't want to do that? So here we've got representation from the theory of constraints. So, um, Simone, when you think about what happens um, when we automate a bad process, what are the consequences of automating things like spots and automating tangents and things like that? What's the consequence? Oh, I've always said we just do the wrong thing faster. Uh, you know, it's so funny when we think about, you know, efficiency versus being effective, right? So a big thing around automation was, you know, we want to be super efficient. We want to push things through faster uh, and that sort of thing. But um, quite often what people haven't done is, you know, including how we communicate, you know, what, what are the channels we're using to communicate or how much are we, we trusting things uh, to do what it needs to do. Um, so <laughs> it's like, well, we need to look at the effectiveness side, which is more towards outcome. Are we getting the right results? Because you can be really efficient, but you can be really efficient at doing the wrong things. So that's how I see, you know, uh, being part of what we've talked about before. Um, you know, technology is more a verb now, 
are we curing things or curating process pain? I love that. You know, that adding in from my perspective, you know, um, part of the point of automating is to improve reliability. So if you have a, a process that's automated and it's not reliable, and I think of unit tests when people are going down that path and they have a unit test, for example, that is, you know, uh, its pass rate is, you know, less than 80% or less than 90%. That's horrible. That's not a test. That's, that's bad. Now you can't trust the results. That's the same one. You know, how much are you really helping yourself? It's one of the other key pieces is that it anonymizes the activity so that a, um, you know, it, how do you make a bad process um, uh, worse? Uh, make it automated so that still the same guy that was doing it before is the only guy that can do it. Now you've uh, got this to uh, a single point of failure again, and you've, you've done no better. Um, it, those are kinds of things to think about it when you are imagining um, you know, bad processes and, and, and what to change. Well, I kind of liken it to, I mean, imagine trusting, I mean, we trust a lot of artificial intelligence systems like anti-lock braking in our cars. So, mm -hmm. you know, could you imagine if, if that system, which is, you know, auto, completely automated, do we actually trust the process by which that's occurring? Correct. So interesting thought pattern. If, if you were to be at the end of uh, just even something really simple, would you still trust it if it meant you needed to put the brakes on? Mm -hmm. So I also think about when you do anything like automate a bad process, it's kind of like when you move house. So it's an opportunity to do some tidying. So if you don't really look at that pro process and figure out where those problems are, you've kind of missed an opportunity to to tidy up your house and make the declutter, <laughs> basically. Yeah. <laughs> it's so true. It, you know, it, in thinking about the, the design of the automation, um, there ought to be more time spent on the process itself and asking the questions why. Um, getting the most, I, I love this analogy of getting the most important things in first to make sure that they all fit. Um, and then, you know, filling in the things around it that that maybe don't matter as much. So Simone's jar of rocks. Talk to us about a jar of rocks. Sorry, I just thought the video might try again. But anyway, so jar of rocks conversation. I love this. And it's it's an old story for those of us that have been around a long time, but for any of the newbies, um, you know, a professor uh, in one of his classes pulled out, you know, a jar, a bunch of rocks, pebbles, sand and water. Anyway. The rocks, um, he put all the bunch of rocks into the jar, the big rocks in, and uh, as you can see, close the lid, and he said, is the jar full? And everyone's going, yes. And he said, really? You think this is full? And, you know, unscrewed it again. And then he put the pebbles in. Of course, the pebbles are smaller, so they went in between all the big rocks and filled in some of the gaps and said, is it now full? And they, yes, yes, it's full now. We can see how those empty spaces got filled up. And he said, Really? And then he opened it up again and then he filled it to the top as far as it could go with sand. And of course, sand being smaller than the pebbles and it, all those grains dribbled in between all the extra spaces there and then finally poured in the water. So there was absolutely no air, no space left at all. Now, this is the interesting, thing. I think just Jeff, as you're saying, the truly important things like family, health, relationships, and if everything else was lost, if you lost the water, the sand and the pebbles, you still have those big rocks. They're your big things that give you meaning and they're the things you can actually rebuild with. The pebbles are other important things like you know work and learning, but the sand is the small stuff. You know, and as I did, as I added to the story and said, well, you know, like in Australia, we can have floods and surrounds everything with our emotions. That's what I see the water as. Um, and water can move and shape those rocks, given the fact that if it's got enough movement, we're shaking up of the jar, so to speak. And I think that's what we need to do with our processes sometimes is really decide what are our big rocks? What are our pebbles? The sand is like a refining and the water's like our emotions that go around with it. In, in other words, I guess, how much we care about what those big rocks are. So a big rock in a release process could be the feature or the code, the, the actual piece of value that we're hoping to release. It could be the deployment activity itself. 
And the cab in most in a lot of places might be a rock at the moment, but that might be something we're trying to make a pebble. Is that the right analogy? <laughs> yeah, not necessarily make a pebble. I don't know if we want to break it down. Maybe we'll shape it. <laughs> you know, one of the one of the early uh, maybe uh, maybe knock off a few of the sharp edges and round it off a little. One of the early deployment automations we did at another company it was funny. We we had automated a bunch of the process, but um, it required virtual machines to spin up, spin down on a particular time. And uh, we didn't have that part automated and didn't know yet how to automate. It was all new to the group. And so there was all sorts of things going on. So it required that when one person kicked off the build, another person would have to run over at a precise time and like spin up particular environments, make that happen. And it was enormously stressful because if it didn't happen, the whole build would just basically melt down. Um, you know, things would be going to the wrong place and we'd uh, be versioning things. It would just, we'd have to like roll everything back and, and, and the, the commit trees and all that were just a mess. Um, I think of a big rock in this way of, of the stress that it created to um, the guy that was running the infrastructure was also on the QA team, trying to keep this in place of like his health of how we did a bad process and automated most of it, but automated it in the worst possible way that just created a very difficult time on him. Um, we quickly went to change that because <laughs> it was just not fair to him every time we're gonna run a build um, as we were going through that journey way back then. Um, I'll never forget that though, the impact of, you know, here automation is supposed to make life easier. And this poor guy, I just felt bad for him. Some empathy. Let's see. I'm just going to skip to the other poll, actually, and see if we can get some empathy for our audience today as well. So I'm going to ask the audience, going to start polling, which of these things do you have in your working environment? So do you have cabs? Do you have duplicated system information? Do you have manual creation of reports? Do you have to work around technical debt? Do you have spoffs, single points of failure that are people? Do you have the same that are environments? I think one of the ones we haven't really talked about yet, actually, Jeff, is the working around the technical debt. So um, I think that's, we talk such a lot in DevOps about paying down technical debt. And I don't think we always have empathy for the people that actually don't have the facility or the control to um, pay down the technical debt. And actually they're having to struggle with it and, and work with systems that are out of date or um, production systems that they know have lots of low level defects in them, that they're under pressure to push the new release out and all the lovely new features. Um, what do you think about technical debt? Do people always get the space they need to resolve it? I don't know if they do. I mean, you know, the, a lot of it can evoke emotion because it's like wanting to it's like wanting to throw out your favourite thing in your wardrobe in a way, no matter how tattered and, and scruffy it's become. <laughs> so, it's like, yes, but that was my favourite T-shirt. I'm very mad um, Kondo on this uh, webinar, haven't we? <laughs> well you know it, uh, whatever it evokes the right image or the right feeling for you it's, this is the the cool thing see process to me is like a conversation and the same like with the with the technical debt that occurs is 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 really a lot of that is not just about the equipment itself and emerging technologies or keeping up to date it's actually the, our attitude it's the way we view it it's the way we think about it and I think that's where uh, a lot of the technical debt how that has come about in in a lot of ways and and it's the same with the process we're so used to doing things in a particular way um where process is a con you know process to me is a conversation it's it's that progression and and we need there it's about the interactions um and how we move and shape each other through having those conversations where even if it's a technology to technology that's still a conversation that's still an interaction and and we need to influence how that conversation happens. So let's have a conversation about cabs, but first let's close this poll and have a look at the results from that. So closed poll, which of these things do you have in your environment? Most popular answer, and by the way, people were allowed multiple answers on this one. So is it, not everybody's chosen everything, which is kind of good news. We can see there is some waiting where people are feeling more pain than others. Um, top answer is the single points of failure people. Next is working around technical debt. Next is the manual creation of reports. Then the cabs. So not everyone has cabs. And we'll come back to some comments in chat in a moment. 
Um, then the environment, single points of failure, and then duplicated system information. So we have some great, um, great uh, comments about cabs in the last poll. Um, Vincent said cabs might be very relevant where there is poor process or no process at all. So, of course, we've been talking about um, bad process, but there could be no process um, and they could be useful then. Um, even if they're part of a bad process. Um, cabs can be made semi-automated and can be, and time can be minimised to a large extent. So we're seeing some solutions. And Christopher, who is in a smallish company, says we don't really have a cab, but then he also says, which can be bad in itself because it's often not, unclear, not clear what's okay and what's not. So it's like lack of guardrails there. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about cabs. Um, in Accelerate, it said approval by a manager or cab simply doesn't work to increase the stability of the production systems, which, of course, is the reason it's there, because what's happened, the reason we get cabs in the first place is because we have interdependency between systems, which represents risk, and we see lots of failures as a result. So we introduce controls, also known as bureaucracy, to try and resolve and mitigate those risks. And one of those controls that we often put in is the cab. Um, they go on to say, however, it certainly slows things down. It's in fact worse than having no change approval process at all, according to that research. And Marco Consolari um, added to that, it's way worse because this process has the psychological effect of scorning the competence of developers while adding entropy in the system for no pragmatic reason. Of course, they end up feeling like a cog. We don't know one wants to feel like a cog, do they, Simone? <laughs> Well, it depends on how well I get greased, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think the collaboration is still needed. I mean, you know, I, we, we're still, I don't think we want to be a rusted, squeaky one. You know, we do, we just, we, we want to be part of the flow. We want to be able to help things move. Um, and sometimes it mean, means we have to be reshaped. I mean, we have to ask the questions, is our process capable of meeting the required outcomes? And do we continue to do the job correctly? Because, you know, really the process that's happening, you know, within the cab, um, and I see here that, um, you know, Kieran Langston in the chat has said, well, it's not really about the cabs, is it? Is it more about the change process itself? You know, making it more flexible to, to adapt to DevOps processes. Uh, you know, it's a good thing. But, I mean, I think change processes, change process, you know, we can bring to bear all those guide rails we think about. We've got to understand that it's part of our plumbing. It's how the interactions are balanced. It's how we make people feel as well as think and do. So I think the process policies and CAB is part of that. CAB is part of what is governable, you know, making sure that the veracity of what we have there is important, both in the reporting on it and the process health. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes it's a, it's, it, for, for many folks, it's the first time they actually see, oh, I didn't know all this stuff was going in this time. And, and, you know, at, at the, at the CAB meeting, oftentimes it's it's like wow i i didn't know that was happening <laughs> it's 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 a discovery of how much is going on all at the same time and who else is going where so i think we're all agreed that if we're doing change we need a process but we don't particularly like cabs because they seem to get in the way and they seem to slow things down so we're trying to think about alternatives how can we do what the cab does without having a cab how can we achieve the same goals in terms of mitigating risk so what what is the alternative to cabs? So we've talked to um, one of the audience has already suggested some automation. Another one has said reducing the time. And I think there are other things that we can do as well, like things like peer reviewed lightweight processes. So making those checks within the team by doing things like pair programming and doing code reviews. Um, but then the question becomes, well, how do we go from one place to the other? How do we change our change process? Well, and, you know, not... <laughs> To keep in mind that we might think all that we want to think, but there's going to be an executive reliance, if you will, on some very smart guy that runs that cab who has really set it. I mean, that culture is ingrained. And so somehow we have to do better for the organization in whatever that process comes to be than um, what the cab is currently doing. And we have to prove that it's better. How do we prove that it's better? 
that's the fun part of this conversation. Yeah. Oh, I mean, ultimately, you're not going to get there by just process reengineering. It re it's going to require process reengineering and tooling. And, you know, this is, we, hey, Platora, we're a vendor. This is part of where we come in. Part of the ability that we have is to encapsulate the whole process and enable visibility all along the way, not just at the point in time of cab, and ensure that the right processes are being followed to a degree that the cab can't replicate. So much so that, you know, using a tool like Plotora um, renders the cab sort of redundant. So let's talk. Ouch. Redundancy <laughs> <laughs> isn't always a bad thing. We'll talk about um, uh, the, the steps to take in a minute, but I just want to go back to something Jeff just said, which was about encapsulating the process, which sounded a lot like a checklist to me. Now, in my experience, I've met a lot of organizations where release checklists in particular and security checklists are reviled quite universally within an organization. Why is it that people don't like checklists? I think that part of the um, problem with checklists, it's like, hey, it's, it, it's like every week when I do the grocery shopping list, that's what it's like. It, it's, you know, have I got the essentials? So there's my big rocks again. So a checklist can have the big rocks. But sometimes we miss the smaller things that, you know, we, we get back and, and we're starting to unpack things and put them in the pantry or the fridge or whatever. And we go, oh, damn, I forgot so-and-so. That's like, well, you forgot to put it on the list. I can guarantee you that in all the, you know, ones that I've gone through and the various projects and the handovers and everything else that happened, there's always someone or something that got left off that list somehow. And if that's only one thing, well, I don't know. It depends on the depth of that one thing. Maybe, it, you know, maybe it was a big rock that no one realised that it was a boulder, you know, teetering above their heads and <laughs> it was about to actually, you know, that jar broke and whoosh, those big rocks just flew everywhere. Um, you know, so I think that's part of the reason. I mean, I love lists. I always have because it just helps organise my thinking in certain aspects. But I don't think they are the be-all and the end-all. I think they should be a guidance for conversation Yeah, more than anything. And I think people are resistant to them because they um, – often people don't like being told what to do, and it's like it's, they've just been given a list of tasks, and they may think that some steps on them are irrelevant, and they may have somebody signing off on them that actually doesn't have a clue about whether those steps have been done or not. So it seems like a bit of a pointless pro process. But um, – Kieran in the audience is in quite a nice position. Kieran has said, we have automated <coughs> approvals or we have automated approval processes on changes, standards, pre-approved changes and lightweight change process for relevant systems. So CAB is reserved mainly for critical systems and that has significantly reduced our CAB times. So lovely um, example of how to accelerate that particular point in the overall release process. Um, but not everyone's done that. So Vincent's also asked, what is the best approach to kill cabs when you know there is already a defined process in place? I'm assuming you don't have that much autonomy to address it. So let's have a look about at how we can together have these conversations with our colleagues about how to inspect and optimise that release process. Well, step one really is making the process visible. So making everyone be able to see where dependencies are and things like that. Um, then automating it and then understanding the cycle time. So how long does it take the team to get through that release process? And then finding ways to experiment to improve. And that might be something like um, getting the cap automated or lighter weight. Um, Simone, you have three mm. R's. Tell us about your three R's. Yes, my three R's. Um, I like to say they should stand for relax, recharge and revive because that's the way it should be after, you know, having a change happen, isn't it? You know, sit back, it was relaxed and now it's recharged us and we've revived whatever it is we were hoping to improve. 
Um, but if I look at it this way, refining is the first thing. So practicing it and incremental improvement, I think, is very important. And that's what I would term as optimization of what we already have. And I would say that's more a relaxed mode of, of looking at what we do. Uh, so definitely making it visible and automating it kind of, of, of fits that and that experimenting to improve. So it certainly fits um, what we have up there. The one thing I would probably have on that is um, what I would call the spiraling knowledge or the feedback loops, like there'd be tiny little feedback loops through each of those things circling uh, through each of those facets. Um, the next level I would be looking at once you've sort of think that you've got things the best they could be at this particular time is now you need to look at re-engineering so we've refined it we've got it to the best it can be as we got it now we want to re-engineer it and that's actually changing how it's done and that's a big leap mm -hmm. so you know I think you know killing the cab that's a big leap if you've got a really institutionalized way of doing something so I think refining something to start with taking those smaller incremental steps but re-engineering that's a big leap um, or you can actually do what a lot of others are doing in terms of their, uh, which is a really huge transformation, and completely rethink it. That is in doing it completely differently, it's doing something entirely different. And that's part of what we're talking about when we say kill the cab, because now we're saying, you know what, we've got a completely different way of looking at how we do it and then uh, putting that together as a real, uh, you know, a real experience. So, yes, the three R's, refine, re-engineer or rethink it. But really, when you look at it, it should be about relax, recharge and revive. The the part about this process, I so agree with that. It is just spot on. Part about this, I think, is really fascinating is, is thinking about the role of release management in this journey. Um, making it visible seems like what, you know, is 90 percent of what a release manager does today is is running around, gathering information, coordinating, communicating that, whether it's gathering or communicating or annotating or documenting, um, if that's filling the majority of the time, there's no time for this other stuff. Well, as soon as you can make the process and the work and the progress visible, you start having time to do other stuff. And so the role progresses. So now you're starting to evaluate, well, gosh, maybe I can automate that. And then and not only am I automating it, now I'm, instead of thinking about managing risk, I'm improving the risk because, well, I'm taking humans out of the mix and I'm just automating that piece. Now I'm looking at the efficiency. And like you were talking about, Simone, it's the experimentation to improve, to uh, constantly evolve and get rid of things that are slowing us down, getting rid of those things that are making us not just less efficient, but lower quality. Absolutely. So we need to re-engineer to become more progressive in the way that we approach release management. And we thought it might be quite fun to look at this through the lenses of some work that Brian Finster um, recently published in a Medium article. We'll pop the um, article link in the chat in a moment. Um, but in the preamble of the Agile Manifesto, what he's done is kind of adjusted the Agile Manifesto, which is obviously, what, 20-odd years old now, and just kind of said, well, we've learned a lot in 20 years, and we need to revisit some of these things. And I think we can apply all of these things to what we think about when we think about release management as a process and also as a role. So he's suggesting we move from we are uncovering better ways of developing software by doing it and helping others do it, to we are uncovering better ways of continuously delivering value to the end user and helping others do it. So this is relevant to release managers as well, isn't it, Jeff? Absolutely. It really is. And Samo. <laughs> and Samo. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was just going to say, I mean, what's important about this part of it, uncovering the better ways and continuously doing it, as long as people are ensuring that we're not just looking uh, automating the steps in the process, it, we have to look after the administration of both people and of the progress at the same time that we're also looking at the activities and, and the technology with it. Precisely. I, precisely. I, I don't, I, this is like perfect. It, it, you know, we want to make it sustainable and, you know, the practice being uh, to get out of the redundant um, and into the improving the process continuously. That's the point. 
And this is where we can see very strongly now the link between the release management process as a very important subsegment of the value stream itself. So the value stream itself aims to optimize the flow. And now we're saying that we need to, to do this as part of the release process as well, and connecting the two. Yes. So the next one, which is from the second principle, we used to say that we need to welcome changing requirements, even late in development, agile processes, processes harness change for the customer's competitive advantage. So of course, change and release, we know we've established already today are you know so intertwined, but um, we've changed this, or Brian suggested a change, which is to incorrect, misunderstood or changing requirements are the expectation. We know they're gonna happen. And we embrace this to design a system of delivery to improve the customer's competitive advantage. So changes come through as emergency changes for all sorts of reasons. They could be as a result of a defect that's caused an incident. They could be um, the business deciding that a competitor's done something and they need to um, need to prioritise it much more quickly. Or regulation has changed. Or as, um, or as Brian suggested here, we may have just misunderstood what it was in the first place. But this stuff happens. So how do we optimise the release process to help us be ready for emergency changes? Well, this is when I say to people please in the room, please put your hand up if you are a recovering perfectionist. Because, <laughs> you know, perfection is not the goal and can often be our biggest roadblock, right? Um, you know, we're changing the way we're working. So I think in that background, we need to ensure that we've actually got, you know, our understanding that we're upskilling and reskilling all the time. And that's, you know, something that we, we need to have within ourselves and making ourselves uh, not waste the time and effort by chasing something that is probably going to actually shift again uh, just around the corner. And, you know, visibility is the key here, right? How did we understand or when did we understand that uh, what the requirements were have changed? And then that visibility is what gives us the efficiency and the collaboration we need to go fix problems. A, a simple problem. Hey, you know, I'm, I'm on a on a scaled agile kind of method and, and we release every other week. And um, some team says they've got to make a critical change before we start the deployment. Uh, you know, just as simple as, as trying to you know, collaborate resources of who's going to deploy when and, and which bits and as part of the go live experience, just having visibility of who's using what and when they're scheduled to do things so that you can, um, uh, with agility, respond and react to the people that are needing changes. Um, that's key. And value stream management creates an adaptable and responsive system for us for managing releases. And it, it helps us find um, spaces where we can do things like emergency changes. Third principle, deliver working software frequently from a couple of weeks to a couple of months with a preference to the short time scale. We know we have come on quite some way as an industry in the last 20 years. Continuously deliver working software is now our goal from a couple of hours to a couple of days with a preference to the shorter time scale. So, you know, we're going to be releasing a lot of things very fast um, and release managers, I think, need to be ready for that. It, completely. Um, this is a journey, just like it, it'll be a journey as we, um, you know, take bites out of the cab and, and consume that in, in automated processes that are improved and better than the cab. It's going to take us time to automate the entire journey. Maybe individual teams can get there so they can... Um, um, you, you know, deliver at speed um, and others might take longer. It's okay. Let's work with every team so that we can actually continuously deliver using that as the ultimate goal. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to that. Because, you know, we, the, the more I am, because the more I'm actually quite excited by it, because the more that we can actually do that and and look at that cycle end to end and, 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 you know, we make our choices, you know, we want to get the best out of the technology and get the best out of the humanity. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it, the more we can automate um, yeah, and we can make choices, it doesn't mean we have to, but I think we should really look, take a very good considered look at those things that we can, because... You know, that means the humans, we can actually be doing those more complex things that we've always loved doing. Yep. And, uh, you know, leave the stuff to the technology to do what it does well so that we can do what we do well. Well, and the key 
message here is that the only way to continuously deliver working software, it requires automation and it requires a rethink of the process where um, quality is built in. All of the best practices are built in, not inspected after the fact per se. Um, you know, we verify things before they ever get way down the journey and, and we can make sure that the process is repeatable and trustworthy. So trustworthy that we've got the entire organization on board believing more so in the results of our automation than in a older antiquated process of cab. Absolutely. We'll slow us down. We'll never be able to deliver in a couple of hours with, with cabs um, in the way they are traditionally. Did I just skip one by accident? I did. Sorry about that. Let's look at the fourth principle. Business people and developers must work together daily throughout the project. And we want to change this too. Business people and developers are one product team. And I would suggest there are other roles in that product team. And we'll come back to that uh, in a moment. Um, with birth to death or cradle to grave ownership of the outcome. So we build it, we own it. We are a multifunctional autonomous team. This requires some rethinking, I think, in a re release manager's mind. Yes, it does. Because in those kinds of teams now... Yeah, I'm not quite sure if people, you know, have that feeling of... <laughs> yep, keep going. Ooh, have we lost her after? No, nope, I'm here. <laughs> so I'm not sure if everyone's got that feeling of ownership for the complete end to end. I think sometimes they, you know, that cog feeling that we were talking about earlier can exist. Um, so I think this is really good here that um, if people understand that environment and see where they fit and have that sense of belonging uh, across that flow, um, it's much easier for them to understand their responsibilities in regards to mitigating the risk um, at the speeds that we're trying to take. Precisely. You know, and uh, where does release management fit in this? Are they a permanent member of each product team? Are they a separate organization, you know, division of responsibility? Um, I would say that they now are a member, even if it's a part-time member of each product team to help the the end-to-end -end life cycle of, you know, idea to delivery. And, you know, at, at best, just a coach, in fact, providing data and metrics and visibility so that the right things happen and guiding on those best practices to help um, minimize incident and issue um, with the idea that if you work with that new uh, progressive release management, um, you know, you'll find ways that you can deliver faster and get to continuous software delivery. Yeah, I agree that the, that release manager role <clears throat> is certainly shifting to one that um, is, you know, has that uh, knowledge around uh, that mitigation of risk and really understands that governance. I mean, we've talked previously on previous webinars about them being the gatekeeper, but I think it's it's not a gatekeeper role anymore. You know, that that might have been the, the stop-start point, but I think it's more fluid than that now um, and that they have a, a more prominent role as part of what's happening. So seventh principle, working software is the primary measure of progress. Working software is not the primary measure of progress. Valuable outcomes are. Of course, we could ch chuck out loads of working software, but if no one uses it or likes it, then it's kind of pointless, isn't it? And the release managers need to understand that and have an eye on that too, don't they? Yeah, it's it, the whole the point is, is that value is not there unless we've interacted or experienced it. And, you know, they're, they're going to be the one that everyone comes back to and says, well... I interacted with that and the experience was either a good one or it wasn't. And from that point, we're going to go back to the three R's again. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it had the, the, the Agile Manifesto in that light has such an air of, you know, the goal was just don't blow up production. You know, mm. hey, working software, we got it there, we shipped it, woohoo! You know, let's measure bug counts. Really? Is that really what we care about? We care just that we didn't blow anything up. Um, you know, we can count bugs and, and we'll measure success at that point. Um, I, no small software startup in the world is going to look at the 
uh, the fact that they delivered software as, as the outcome. You know, you, you don't get paid for showing up. You get paid for, you know, getting things done and, and making outcomes happen. Um, what's cool from a value stream management perspective is starting to combine not just delivery, but the value realization. How did we do? What were the incidents? Were there, you know, outages? Sure. But are people actually using it? That's what's interesting. Yeah, we want downtime to zero, don't we, really? And it all being about how much the customer liked it and why. Twelfth principle, at regular intervals, the team reflects on how to become more effective, then tunes and adjusts its behaviour accordingly. Regular intervals isn't enough. What we want is the team continuously reflecting on the things that cause pain, reduce morale and increase delivery drag on the team. And then they tune and adjust their behaviour accordingly, using data to validate the changes. But where, Jeff? Where are they going to get that data? <laughs> where, where, indeed. Well, they're going to need a tool that helps bring that data in. It has to be uh, automatic and transparent. You can't have stuff that you have to manually gather. That's, you know, this just has to all happen. And that reflection process. You know, is there's, you yeah, there's a really good test around that, Jeff, because I've got a couple of key questions I always ask at this point. That's um, how would someone bypass this activity? Because even if we've got it automated and somebody comes across something, um, or should this activity be bypassed or have an alternative <coughs> flow? In other words, is it a single point of failure? So, but I do love the bypassing question because, you know, if things are too hard or it's taking too long, uh, for some reason, humans have this um, wonderful, innovative sense of creativity, finding a way around things. <laughs> yep, precisely. Good. So back to or thinking back on what we said about the team being the business people and developers working together on one team and building and owning it from idea to value realization. Well, let's think about the value stream or the value cycle itself. So everything from ideas to realization where we see the insights which come back into our cycle. And what we're seeing here is the representation of everyone that's involved in that cycle. And we can see, and we've got our release engineers here and our change managers, but you could re read that as release manager um, as well. We can see they are one cog in our very important wheel and they need to be well greased, as Simone said, everyone needs to be well greased to get us um, from the start to the finish. So um, all these people, Jeff, how, how can all these people work together and see what they need to be able to see? Well, the, I think the secret here is that each of these people are working with a general set of tools, but the data from those tools can be uh, unified and brought into a, a common area, if you will, that make them transparent and, and cohesive with each other. Um, you know, the business analysts, product managers can put requirements in, sales and marketing can check progress of deliverables, security can add requirements and activities in the same kind of systems. I mean, you can kind of go across the board to, to track the progress of things with visibility being the key um, and being able to model the whole process as a value stream um, and, and check progress and, and collaborate across and really make the, uh, the tool chain a converged tool chain where, um, you know, uh, progress gathering statuses, activities are all just automatically uh, gathered because people are still working in the tools that they work in. Um, the value cycle is key because following the value, you can follow the data um, and see what yeah. they do. I really like that. And I really like what you've said there too, because in terms of that visibility, one of the things I come across a lot is without that, um, we've got a lot of duplication of data happening via different tool sets because everyone's got their own little repository and the way they, you know, um, gather and use that data. Whereas by having it looking from, uh, you know, this facet, they're actually able to see where they're working together with the same data sometimes. Absolutely. So, you know, this is, um, value stream management is a new category. It's been around now for just, uh, just about a couple of years. It is the next iteration of where Agile and DevOps come together and, and have some unique challenges that need to be solved in order to progress. Um, and, and these challenges fit in the category really of visibility and management. 
whether it's visibility of uh, individual application delivery pipelines, being able to see from idea back from when, when the folks creating a, a you know a, a business plan say, well, wouldn't it be cool if, and here's some initiatives that would support that, all the way into delivery and collaborating across the various tools. Well, if you can't see what's happening in a single um, delivery pipeline and, and value stream, you're going to have a really hard time seeing what's at the portfolio level, where there's dependencies, touch points, and, and uh, stages of delivery. Well, each of those teams are working in different methodologies, different states of their DevOps and Agile capabilities um, need some way to manage across that because, you know, this this isn't happening in isolation. Some teams may be more waterfalls. Some teams may be way on the other end. And we don't want to manage them all the same because we're going to penalize the folks that are moving faster with legacy processes of the past. Well, that then takes us into if you can't do any of that, you certainly aren't having data nor metrics to help guide continuous improvement. We need to be at the point of experimentation. That requires data. The mentality has to be let's practice and find out if what we're doing is actually working. Well, um, this is where value stream management comes in to solve these problems and it fuels process innovation and it gives the ability to uh, attack all these different aspects of uh, Brian's uh, updated agile manifesto from a release point of view and really from a product team point of view and bringing all these bits together is pretty key so that uh, teams can be more efficient and be in a world of experimentation. Um, that data and that visibility really helps everything. Quality, uh, being able to uh, uh, automate processes while re-engineering them, getting everyone thinking about the same goal of delivering value versus delivering widgets or keeping the lights on or, or making sure production doesn't go down. All good things, but let's focus on delivering value to our customers, what that really means. You know, and finally, this is where Platora, hey, we're a vendor. We're one of the leaders of the value stream management platform category fit in. What do we do? We ingest data from across the tool chain, and then we model the pipelines. We model the environments and the deployment activities, giving you a way to look at all the different activities as we ingest data and um, correlate that across the, the tool chain. And then we give you some decision-making analytics insights into where the problem areas are, enabling release managers to work by exception, if you will, um, to model the process and include automation so that you can get out of the day-to-day. -day. Um, and if you're still checklist-based, we can do that too. Um, take wherever you are and start there and start moving it forward, making the process visible, helping you through the journey of automation and getting you to the point to where you're a trusted advisor with each team. Um, all these are really key and, and help you in your journey of progressing release management. You need a tool. You're never gonna get there if 90% of your time is data gathering, data communication, status reporting. Um, and this is the way to do it. It will give you time to actually improve the process. And Helen, you can talk about some of the stuff that we have uh, put in here. There's a new ebook that we've just worked on. We did, yes, we wrote a book about how to implement this, so a practical guide to looking at things like cabs and identifying where you've got conflicts across environments you need to mitigate risks and all sorts of other um, lovely things. So please do go ahead and download it and read it and let us have your feedback. Absolutely. So final takeaways? Final takeaways. Uh, you can kill your cab and you will feel better for it. You can <laughs> revolutionise the ways of working in your organisation. Value stream management is the key to doing that. And you can evolve your role and be an agent for change. I think we have two minutes left. So there is uh, how to get hold of Simone, should you wish. And Charlene, I think, will have a couple of things to say. Oh, no, I absolutely enjoy it. I always love talking about stuff and helping people uh, on the journey, if you like to, uh, enjoying a better working life. Right. 
All right, great. Well, I do want to thank everybody who did uh, submit questions and comments during today's presentation. If we didn't get to your question or comment, please know that the folks at Platora are going to be getting a answered or your comment addressed. Uh, another quick reminder that today's event has been recorded. So if you missed any or all of the event, or if you just want to watch it again, you'll have the opportunity to do so. Following the webinar, we are going to be sending out an email that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. And the webinar is also going to be living on the devops.com website. So you can go look there for it. Just go to devops.com slash webinars, look in the on demand section, and it should be right there waiting for you. All right, real quick, uh, racing against the clock. Let's do the uh, drawing for the four twenty-five dollar Amazon gift cards. We have Leslie K, Barry P, D H, and Jim C as our four winners today. We'll be following up with all four of you. Congratulations! We'll be following up with all four of you by email to get your Amazon gift cards over to you. Uh, Simone, Helen, Jeff, thanks so much for a great presentation. As always, really, really do appreciate your time and your expertise as always. So thanks very much. I also want to thank the audience for joining me today. This is Charlene O'Hanlon and I am signing off. Have a great day, everybody. And please, whatever you do, stay safe.